Okay, this presentation is all about modern atomic structure. Uh, so we've looked in previous presentations about how uh, protons, neutrons and electrons make up the atom and how we've come to this modern atomic structure in terms of moving forward from Dalton's uh, idea of spheres making up elements or being elements through to the plum pudding model and alpha scattering. So we're going to look at the modern structure today in terms of mass numbers, atomic numbers and electron structures. But just as a starter, just to get you thinking and get you warmed up, I'd like you to have a think about how the energy and movement of particles changes when a substance changes from a solid to a liquid. Two minutes on this. So if you hit pause on your uh, video now and then we will go through it. OK, so if we look at the diagram here, the left side of this arrow represents the particle arrangement in a solid. So we can see the particles in a solid very tightly arranged, all touching, vibrating about fixed points. When we apply thermal energy or heat energy or energy from a thermal store, then what happens is this adds or it's converted into a kinetic energy store. So the particles start to move and as they move, they, they vibrate faster and faster until eventually they overcome those intermolecular forces of attraction and they start to break away from these fixed positions. And eventually this is broken so much, these inter intermolecular forces, so that the particles can slide over one another and they've become a liquid. So essentially when you increase uh, the, the kinetic energy or sorry the thermal energy that in turn increases the kinetic energy so the, the the increase in thermal energy increases the movement of particles and allows that change of state to occur so in terms of what we're going to look at through this uh, presentation is to understand how we represent the atom if you can recall how electrons are arranged in the first 20 atoms and you can draw those electron structures then you look in sort of round about a grade four type skill Similarly, if you can describe what the mass number and atomic number tell us, this is also a grade four skill. But if you can explain how to use the periodic table tiles, it can go up to a grade six and above. At its simplest level, using the tiles to work out the protons, neutrons and electrons is quite a, a lower end skill, sort of a four or five. But when we get onto isotope calculations, which you can see in a further presentation, um, you can see it can get up to a beyond a grade six. Why do we need to know it? Well, you've dealt with the periodic table through all of your time at the secondary school. Um, and so you know what's on this periodic table. But the tiles reveal a lot more information than just a symbol, a name and two numbers. And if you can remember what you can get and all those basics and how to use those periodic table tiles, then you get a much greater breadth and depth of knowledge, which will give you that success in exams and assessments. So if we think about the modern atom, we've looked in previous presentations and in class how the work of prominent chemists down the years has led to us knowing that we have an atom with a nucleus containing protons and neutrons with electrons around the outside in shells. But the nucleus itself is actually only a very small part of the atom. In fact, if we look at an atom, its diameter is around 100,000 times larger than the diameter of the nucleus. Now, if you want to give that some context, if you have a look at this picture of a cricket ground, if we look just in the middle, this little black dot that's appeared, that is the nucleus. So it's tiny in comparison, because if we look, this circle represents the first electron shell or the first energy level, the lowest energy level that electrons can be held in. Now, the dot in comparison is tiny. There's a vast distance to this first energy level and any further shells that will be beyond this so we can see the nucleus is actually quite small in comparison okay a little bit of a recap task for you then to get you warmed up so there's a diagram and a few questions i'm not going to say too much about them you'll probably need two to three minutes to have a go at these so have a look at the diagram and try and think about what could go in the labels and then there are a few questions for you so if you want to pause the video Two to, two to three minutes and then we'll go through it. OK, just as a bit of a word of caution, obviously none of this, when we look at atomic models, none of this is to scale. We know that electrons aren't blue. We know that, you know, these shells aren't like nice little racetracks, but it's just that word of caution. It's a representation. So if we start with the electron, these blue spheres, they travel around the nucleus and they travel around in these shells here. And the shell shows the path electrons take as they go around the nucleus.
In the centre we have the uh, nucleus as we know and in that nucleus we have protons and neutrons. And I've put here that there's empty space between the nucleus and the shells. If we take the questions, what is smaller, an atom or a proton? Clearly, it's got to be a proton because the proton is part of an atom. So it can't be bigger than the thing that it makes up. What is between the electrons? I've put as far as we know, empty space. It would be acceptable to put empty space uh, as your answer. I've put as far as we know, because do we really know what that empty space is? Is it actually something that's not been discovered yet? It's a question for another day. Question four and question seven I'll take together. The charge of an electron is minus one or negative and the charge of a proton is positive one or a positive charge. Just to remember P for positive, P for proton. And finally, I'll take question five and six together because they link. The student draws an atom and labels the centre nucleus with electrons. Why are they wrong? Well, we know electrons aren't found in the nucleus. They're found in shells. So the label the student should use is the nucleus with protons and neutrons. Let's take the numbers on the periodic table tiles then. So the first one we'll look at is the atomic number. This is the bottom number. This is like the identifier, if you like. This is what tells you what a, an element is in the periodic table. Originally, the periodic table ordered elements based upon their mass. Uh, so when Mendeleev put it together, he put them in order of atomic weight, as it was called. But it meant that some elements were grouped incorrectly. So he had certain elements that didn't fit with the pattern that they should in terms of reactivity. So he'd move things about, but that changed the order of mass and was quite controversial. And some chemists didn't agree with it. And this was the case until 1913 when Henry Moseley found that changing the order was actually the correct thing to do. And Mendeleev was right. He proved that elements should be in the order of the amount of positive charges. And this was five years before the proton was discovered. So Mendeleev was at least vindicated in some way where his pair reversals were justified. So what does the atomic number tell us? Well, by definition, it tells us the number of positive charges or protons. And that's how we now order the periodic table. So we know that hydrogen has one proton, helium has two protons, lithium three protons and so on. And this corresponds with that bottom number on the periodic table. So if we know an element has an atomic number of 18, we know it will have 18 protons. And that allows us to use the periodic table and look for the bottom number of 18. And that shows us that it is argon. Now, the other thing that we can do with this is because we know elements in the periodic table are electrostatically balanced, they have the same number of positive and negative charges. Then we know if it's got 18 protons, it must have 18 electrons because they are negatively charged and the negative and positive charges must be equal. The next one we'll look at is the mass number. OK, so it's this top number on the periodic table tiles. So we've just tackled the, uh, the atomic number. Now we're looking at the mass number. So we know if an atom has a mass number of 12, it's got 12 particles that have some mass. And that mass comes from the protons and neutrons. The bottom number is the atomic number, and that tells us the proton number. So in this case for carbon, there is six. So what else can we work out? Well, we know electrons are almost zero. One 1840th of the mass of a proton or a neutron. So we don't count them. So we know, therefore, that all the mass must be in the nucleus and therefore all that mass comes from the total number of protons and neutrons combined. So looking at this, carbon has an atomic number of six, which tells us it's got six protons. It also, therefore, tells us it's got six electrons, which we don't need to worry about, but the information's there. The total mass is 12 from this top number. Now, we know that six of that 12 are protons. So the other six of that mass must be neutrons. If you're in doubt, subtract the atomic number from the mass number to work out the number of neutrons. So 12 take away six is six. And it tells us it's got six neutrons. And if we know the atomic number and the mass number, then we can work out the proton, neutron and electron number. So I said earlier in this presentation that actually this letter and two numbers and the name of the element it's very small in terms of what you see on the periodic table but the power of it is there in terms of what else we can work out okay a few questions now looking at um relative masses so 
I'm going to leave this up. This is literally a two-minute task. First one's done for you. An atom has seven protons. What would its relative, uh, relative mass be? A proton has a mass of one. Seven times one is seven. Just a word of caution. These are imaginary atoms. These aren't atoms that exist as such because we know clearly if something had seven protons, it would have some neutrons as well. You are just looking at the question at face value. So two minutes, pause the video and see if you can have a go at those. OK, straight into it then. So if an atom has nine protons and no neutrons, its relative mass would be nine. Nine multiplied by one, nine protons. Bit of interleaving, recap of previous learning. Question three, two differences between the plum pudding and nuclear models of the atom. Uh, the plum pudding, I've given you three here, so you've got a few to choose from. But the plum pudding shows a large area of positive charge, but we know the nuclear model says that the positive charge is concentrated in a small area, the nucleus. The plum pudding model doesn't reference protons or neutrons, but the nuclear model does it. They are mentioned as part of that model. And finally, the plum pudding model says electrons are stuck in the positive charge. We talk about plums in a plum pudding, as was described at the time by J.J. Thompson. But the nuclear model has the electrons in orbitals going around the outside. Question four, five and six, relatively straightforward. They just get slightly more difficult as we go along. So question four, an atom has 12 neutrons, so its mass is 12. Question five, it has 14 neutrons and eight protons. So 14 plus eight is 22. And finally, question six, a little bit of a red herring here because it talks about electrons, but we know electrons don't have mass. So if it's got 21 neutrons and 20 protons, the combined sum of those two numbers is 41. OK, another task for you. There's a table here. All this can be got from the periodic table. Uh, so the element name, symbol, atomic number, mass number, and obviously doing mass number, subtracting the atomic number gives us our neutron number. So first one's done. Hydrogen has a symbol of H. The bottom number is one. The top number is one. One take away one is zero. So there are zero neutrons. Uh, probably take about five minutes to sketch out this table and maybe another five to ten minutes to do it. So if you can pause the video now, so hit pause. Give yourself 10 to 15 minutes or as long as you need to finish this table. And when you've done, press play and we will go through them. OK, so I'm just going to pop the answers up. All the answers, all the blanks are now yellow. So you can see there, I'll just take a few of these. I'm not going to go through them. So while they're on screen, if you would like to mark your own and fill in your own answers if you've missed any out and see if they make sense if you didn't understand it. So first one straightforward, you find in nitrogen on the periodic table and you can see its symbol is N. I've already given you the atomic number or bottom number of seven and the mass number, top number of 14. 14 take away seven gives us our neutron number. Just to pick a few of these out. So first one I'll look at is Fe. You were given Fe which you, if you find on your periodic table, that is iron. It has a bottom number of 26. So you identify that and you can see from your periodic table, the top number is 56. 56 take away 26 is 30. Again, uh, if we look at tellurium, so you have to find tellurium on your periodic table and you can see that tellurium is TE. And looking at the bottom number for tellurium, it is 52. You're given that it's 128 for the mass number. So 128 take away 52 is 76. OK, I'm just going to give you a minute now. If you need to pause the video, please pause it now and you can fill out the gaps. OK. Moving on to electrons. So we know electrons are arranged in shells around the nucleus and the shells have different energy levels. The shell closest to the nucleus has the lowest energy level. Shells getting further away have more and more um, energy. And each energy level or shell can only hold a certain number of electrons. And you need to remember these values. So first shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. If something's got three electrons, it would have two in the first shell and then the next electron would have to go into the second shell, which can hold up to eight electrons. So if something had 12 electrons, it would have two in the first shell, then it's full. Eight in the second shell, then it's full. That's 10 electrons so far. So the remaining two go into the third shell, which can also hold up to eight electrons. Once the third shell's full, we start to begin to fill the fourth shell. 
Now, luckily for your exam, you only need to know the electron arrangements for the first 20 elements up to calcium. So you're never going to go above two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, eight in the second, uh, third shell and two in the fourth shell, because two plus eight plus eight plus two is 20. So we don't need to know how many as a maximum uh, or until the fourth shell is filled. And we write down these electron structures in a way we call the electron configuration. And that's the number of electrons in each shell. So if we take sodium, if you find sodium on your periodic table, it has a bottom number or atomic number of 11. So if we look, we can draw two electrons in the first shell and then it's full. So there's our two. Second shell can hold eight. So we draw those in and then that's full. And finally, our third shell, two in the first, eight in the second is 10 electrons. So our 11th electron is in the third shell. So the electron configuration is two, eight, one, two in the first shell, eight in the second shell and one in the third shell. Now, there's a little bit more information that we can gather from this, because if we look, the periodic table has numbers along the top. They represent the groups. So going from one through to seven and then zero. That group number tells you how many electrons are in the outside shell of that element. So if we take sodium again in a second, it's in group one. It had one electron in its outer shell. So we know that it's in group one. And every other element in group one has one electron in its outer shell and reacts in the same sort of way. And that's the same for all groups. So everything in group three has three electrons in the outer shell. Everything in group seven has seven electrons in the outer shell. The exception to this is group zero. It doesn't mean they've got no electrons in their outer shell. What it actually means is the shell is full, so it can't fit anymore in. It can fit zero electrons into that shell. So if we look, lithium, it has an atomic number of three. The first shell holds two. The second shell holds one. Sodium we've looked at with its atomic number of 11, two in the first gel, eight in the second and one in the third. And finally, potassium, two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, eight in the third shell. So two, eight, eight and then one in the third shell, which is our atomic number of 19. OK. Final task then. These are just some examples of exam style questions. So. Very typically sort of at a lower level uh, recall type question, which is question one, uh, just finding an element in the periodic table, looking at the bottom number and seeing how many electrons it has. A little bit more difficult for the second one, talking about electron arrangements in the shells. Um, again, some interleaving on plum pudding a nuclear model, but in terms of electrons and then finally drawing those first 20 atoms. So if you want to hit pause, this will probably take you about 20 minutes because task four is quite um, a, a long drawn out one because you've got to draw these electron arrangements. So if you hit pause now and then press play when you're ready to go through these. OK, for question one, all I've done is I've looked at that atomic number at the bottom. So iron has an atomic number of 26, 26 protons, positive charges. So it must have 26 negative charges from the electrons. And just working those down, you can see them there. I'll not go through those. How are the electrons arranged in an atom? Uh, I've gone into a bit of detail here. They're arranged in, in shells or energy levels with the first shell holding a maximum of two and the second and third shells holding a maximum of eight electrons. And in terms of the electrons, the difference between the plum pudding and nuclear model is that the plum pudding model talks about electrons being stuck in this sphere of positive charge, plums in a plum pudding, but the nuclear model states that electrons are in shells orbiting the nucleus. And finally, I'll just knock it on another slide. There are your first 20 electron arrangements. I'm just going to move myself out of the way here so you can see them all. So hydrogen here with one electron in its outer shell. So we draw the one there. Helium with two. And then we know that that shell's full. So the next one is lithium with three. That third electron goes into the second shell. And as we move along, you can see an electron being added each time until we get to neon, which has a notation of two, eight. First shell is full with two. Second shell is full with eight. So we move on to a third shell. And it's important that you write this annotation like it. And if we look, we can see group one. One electron in its outer shell, lithium, sodium, potassium. If we look at group seven, 
fluorine and chlorine, seven electrons in their outer shell. So the rule about the electrons out in the outer shell shows us they are grouped correctly and Mendeleev was correct in what he did. So in summary, what you should be taking from this presentation and hopefully it's helped you to have better understanding is about the modern periodic table in terms of protons, neutrons and electrons, but more importantly, those two numbers, the mass number and the atomic number. By having that knowledge of mass number and atomic number, you can clearly see you can work out proton number, neutron number and electron number. From that electron number, you can draw electron configurations showing how many electrons are in each of the set, uh, shells. And also by doing that, you can see what element, uh, what group rather an element is in based on the number of electrons in the outer shell. So as we said at the start, in terms of those periodic table tiles, they are very powerful, not just two numbers, a letter and a symbol.